Hello fellow podcasters, and today we have Christopher Paolini's Murtad. I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation, but we're rolling with it. And this was honestly one of my favorite books ever by Paolini that I've read so far. To be fair, I've only read his original uh, Aragon series, The Inheritance Cycle, four books. Um, other than this, however, I just it was just so good. And yeah, let's talk about it. So, first of all, the summary. Obviously, spoiler-filled as usual. So basically, it starts with Murtag at a bar with a, with a deal, with a kind of a shady trader guy. And he's looking for this darkness that's simmering around the edges of Allegasia. And basically, it's a bird, it's a bird skeleton amulet thing. And he kind of doesn't know what it is, and he gets it from the trader guy. There's a minor scuffle, but basically it's from some witch, and dreamers are mentioned. And Murtag doesn't want there to be any threat to Nessu Aegis' throne. Uh, if you don't get any of what I'm saying here, you need to read the previous books, or watch all my previous reviews. Um, basically, so, Murtag needs to investigate this bird skull. However, he doesn't have any information, because that's not his thing. He's a dragon rider, he has his lovely red dragon thorn, however, and he can use magic, and that's about it. So, he goes to Gilead, where a girl that he knew from his past life, who is a kind of like a spy master, he thought that she would be useful in gathering some information. However, instead of reaching the girl, he ends up trading with a werecat who claims to have information about what that he is looking for. So he goes on this little side quest thing, infiltrating the guards, because apparently they've stolen the werecat children, which is a horrible thing to do, and we don't know why the guards of the city, who should be loyal to Nesueda, will be doing that kind of thing. So we kind of go in, we do a bunch of stuff, kind of a side quest, I'm not going to go into detail, and he manages to get the information out of the Wercat. And the information is this, there's this witch called Batchel, and this place called Nalgorath. And there, at, at the edge of Allegasia, this evil witch woman lives. And it is a haunting place, smelling of brimstone, and something is very wrong with that place. And with that information, and with a new added bonus of being friends of the Werecats, um, Thorn and Murtag set sail, well, set flight, to this mysterious place. And they fight for quite some time, and they reach that place, where we meet Bachel. Bachel the Witch is kind of like an intimidating person, and now Gorath is pretty much infested with people who have been brainwashed by her to join her cult. They are dreamers, and they apparently worship something called the, the Dreamer of Dreams, or whatever. And they worship Bachel, essentially, because they believe Bachel is the savior, or the incarnation of their god in human form. And that's, you know, pretty typical of cults, because then that's what you do, right? So, there, so Murtag is there, and he's trying to investigate peacefully at first, and then it escalates, and he needs to fight. However, he ends up getting trapped by Bachel, and then tortured by which his will is broken and he's forced into servitude because he's constantly under the, an influence of this magic drug thing that keeps him from using magic. And this is kind of hindering to him, and he kind of is under Bachel's slavery, just like he was under Galvatorix's slavery for quite some time. However, thankfully, with the help of this girl called Alin, who is a maid who has lost faith in this whole business of Bachel's and destroying the world, pretty much, it seems, um, Murtag gets free, and, uh, and also he meets Uvek, who is one of the shamans of the Urgals, who is also trapped within the same cell, and they become blood brothers somehow, and together with their combined strength, they manage to reach an, some energy that is kept within a gem, and Murtag manages to break free, and the fight final battle commences. And in the final battle, Bachel takes Alin captive, by which we go down into the caverns, fight Bachel, and we see Azlagur, which seems to be the thing that they that they um worship, which is an evil dragon, a black dragon, big black dragon devourer, something like that. And so we we send a laser beam to it. It it, get, it dies. Probably, pr we're pretty sure it doesn't die, but it dies, and we kill Bachel. And that's the end of the final battle. And it ends with Murtag being hurt badly. He flies back to Nesueda, who heals him, and he decides to stay with Nesueda instead of being an outcast. And that's the entirety of the plot, pretty badly summarized into a couple words. And here comes the analysis. So, I think honestly the most important part of um, Murtag is the characters, especially the side characters, Uvek, Alin, and Lyrath. Uh, I didn't mention Lyrath, but essentially Lyrath is this, kind of this 
plump aristocratic kid who, who was another one kind of similar to Murtag in terms of his birth and where he was. However, he's basically what Murtag would have been if Murtag didn't run away with the help of Tornak, the sword master guy that taught him sword master reasons. And basically, these three characters are all, well, I kind of spoiled it, fold characters. Lyreth represents Murtag if he didn't leave Galbatorix's court. Alin represents Murtag if he never escaped Galbatorix's servitude. And Ubek is, represents Murtag now, an outcast, unable to socially interact with anyone and unable to talk with his friends because he is burdened by his own sins. And thanks to these fold characters, actually Murtag comes to realize that he can't be alone. Being free doesn't mean being an outcast and never talking to anyone and just flying the sky with Thor and his dragon. Being free means being free to make the choices he wants. And right now he wants to be with Nesueda, and so he decides to stay. The Fold characters, his interactions with the Fold characters and of course the plot, drives Murtag's character development towards the direction of not being an outcast, not being a traitor but a hero, someone in the light instead of someone who's in the darkness, someone who's recognized. And that beautiful arc ends with him, you know, staying, deciding to stay with Nesueda. And I thought that was really, really well done. I've always thought in the original um, Inheritance Cycle that Murtag felt a lot like pretty much Darth Vader, right? I always thought, oh, Goblet Torix is kind of the Emperor, and then he's Vader, right? He's Darth Vader, he's the guy that betrays the emperor and then kills him with the uh, kills him with the help of you know our Luke Skywalker who's in this case is Aragon right and Aragon goes off to make the new Dragon Order Luke goes off to make the new Jedi Order I saw to make a lot of parallels there I thought Christopher Polony was very inspired by Jedi Order however this added a new layer to Murtag that really made him a new character for me because for me he was just the Darth Vader copycat. But now he, he was definitely a unique character, finally, to me, where he is plagued by what he's done. He's, he's not welcome anywhere, even though he tried his best, and he was the one, and he was forced his hand for all the evil that he's done, and he did a lot of good, and Aragorn wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been able to defeat Galvatorix without him. However, he's still an outcast, right? However, he wants to be free, he doesn't want to be tied down, he doesn't want to serve under a king or a queen or anyone, really. So we got this really interesting conflicted character who goes through this amazing character or interacting with these bold characters to become truly free. And there's a key moment within the book that I believe represents that because he replaces his sword, Zarok, which means despair in the ancient language. He renames it to freedom, Ithric. And, and that moment, that is a turning point, I believe, where he renames his sword and uses it to strike down Batchel. I believe we see a side of Murtag that we've never seen before, a side that yearns for freedom, in fact, is a representation of freedom. Someone who is not welcome anywhere, but doesn't care and stays with the people he wants. And we see this new Murtag finally interact at the end of the book. So in other words, Murtag, quite fittingly, is a perfect character study of this character. And we see this new side of him that we've never seen before, and for me, it. It was a remaking of a character that was a wannabe Darth Vader to a unique character. And that's what I loved about this book. And I don't really have any other critiques of it. I love how Christopher Pauline is like born with like medieval, medieval like fantasy stories like in his blood. So whenever he writes one of these, it feels like this classic quest. And I found myself just launching back into the world of Elegasia when it's been like three years since I've last interacted with it. I love the battle scenes. I really love how Paolini plays with how magic works and the mind battles are always very thrilling. And I thought overall, it was excellently written, excellently plotted, and the character development was top notch. It's a very classic story about the power friendship, basically. But it is done in a way where it feels unique, it feels new, it feels Paolini, and I loved it. I rated it like a 9.5 out, 9 out of 10. Honestly, I believe this is what high fantasy YA should strive for. And it is my genre of writing after all, so extra points because of that. And that's about it. I would highly recommend this particular book. I feel like you could definitely read it even without the context of the whole Aragon inheritance cycle because I barely remember what happened then, but I still absolutely enjoyed it. 
But again, I would recommend, well, all of Paolini's work. And that's about it. And like always, your plot cluster, Aaron the Plot Cluster, great book, highly recommend, and goodbye.